constant caloric restriction isn't the answer. Right. So we now look to other things. And you've maybe heard me talk about this, but I kind of have this framework, right, that says, on the one hand, we have this thing called the standard American diet, which is sort of the cesspool of nutrition we all live in. Um, so that's that's the environment where food is infinitely abundant, infinitely cheap, infinitely palatable, uh, and, and, and infinitely transportable. So meaning it's so processed that it, you can actually take it with you anywhere, right? Um, and it's hard to escape the gravitational pull of that. So we're all sort of in this orbit around the standard American diet. And there's basically a handful of ways out. So I think one, one avenue out of that is time-restricted feeding, where you start to say, well, look, I'm not going to restrict what I'm eating. I'm not going to engage in any form of dietary restriction. I'm just going to limit the window in which I expose myself to this toxicity. So I'll not eat for 16 hours, but I will eat for eight hours. And you can obviously make that window narrow and narrow. And then there's the, uh, then there's what I call dietary restriction. You and I use these terms a little differently, although I know what you're meaning when you say it. When I refer to dietary restriction, I mean no attempt at reducing the uh, content but rather changing the mixture or quality. So dietary restriction, which is probably what most people think of when they think of a diet, like a, a paleo diet, a vegan diet, a keto diet, a low carb diet, they're not explicitly telling you to eat less. They're just telling you to not eat in certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and so those two become, I think the mainstay of how most people are trying to escape the gravitational pull of the standard American diet. And then you can actually talk about intermittent forms of fasting. Um, and that can be complete, such as, hey, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm just going to have water for three days every month or every quarter. And they can be partial, sort of like the fast mimicking diet where for five days you consume, you know, 750 calories. Um, when you think about that entire landscape, where do you think we have the best insight about the health benefits? Well, first of all, these are all pretty new mm -hmm. ideas, and I don't think they've had a lot of empirical testing at this point. And the empirical and testing that they have had has mostly been in people that already had some health issues that were diabetic or pre-diabetic or something like that. However, the logic of it is pretty compelling. And this is, some, this is something we have learned from the mice. You know, from the mice we've, in the rapamycin studies, we looked, we've learned how suppressing this gene called mTOR can have multiple health benefits. And now we know that it doesn't take that much fasting to also suppress mTOR. So we now kind of have an idea. So, you know, one of the things we should probably mention is that the people that were studying mice and rats, you know, years later started noticing, well, wait a second, and I noticed this when we would go to feed these animals, they're right there, they're doing pull-ups on the cage waiting for you to get the food, and you know, literally within half an hour, all their food is gone. And what we never really thought about until recently is, wait a second, maybe it's the timing that's the important thing. The fact that they're fasting for 23 hours a day or 23 and a half hours a day, maybe that more than the total consumption or as much as the total consumption is doing it. And now we kind of have a molecular mechanism for understanding how a period of fasting might have benefits and might have short-term benefits. I mean, I think that's one of the really interesting things is that these short-term fasts, whether they're in mice or, or, or humans seem to have multiple benefits. I mean, one of the, I think one of the most groundbreaking studies was by Jay Mitchell, um, unfortunately. Who just passed recently. away a year ago. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah terrible, terrible um, bicycle. But it, it, he showed that if you fasted a mouse for two or three days, they recovered from surgery so much faster. Well, than, well, well actually, yeah. Steve, I mean, we should double click on that a little bit because it's not just that they recovered yeah. from surgery. They recovered from a lethal injury. Right. There's one right. experiment he <laughs> right, did right. where yeah. I think if, I, if I'm thinking of the right experiment, 
They took a group of mice that were constitutively calorically restricted their entire lives. They took another group that were fed ad lib their whole lives. And then they took another group that were ad lib fed, but I think three days prior to the surgery were severely calorically restricted. So, so each of them then had the same procedure, which was a laparotomy with a ligation of the femoral arteries for a period of time and then a reperfusion. So what, you know, for the folks listening, what that means is you clamp off all the blood supply to the lower part of the leg. And then, you know, basically just before the animal's about to die, you let it, you let the blood flow again. But because of all of the ischemic damage to the tissue, all the tissue damage due to no oxygen, you create such an injury to the animal that I believe all of the ad lib animals died from that. But yet the two groups that were calorically restricted, one its entire life and one just for three days survived, suggesting that just that period of caloric restriction could produce a similar benefit. Now I could be a little wrong on the numbers, but that was sort of the gist of my memory. Is that correct? Yeah, well, what he did, the, the it actually cut off blood supply of the kidneys. Was it and the then kidneys? He okay. Had another, yeah. He had another one that they did the liver. Okay. Same result though. And you're exactly right. They did these ones that have been calorically restricted their whole lives, the ones that have been that were ad lib, and then the ones that have been fasted for. They did some that have been fast uh, restricted for a few weeks, and then some that have been just fasted, water only fast for a day, for two or three days, okay. for two two or three days. That's a big and fast for a mouse. <laughs> it is a big fast. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And they did much better. You're right. I don't remember if all of the controls died, but if not, almost all of them did. And 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 the ones that were restricted lifetime or for two or three days, I think none of them died. So you're right. It's yeah. When I said a surgery, I guess I was thinking about it from a mouseologist standpoint, where a lot of our surgeries don't turn out so well. Yeah. But yeah, this this wasn't a minor uh, surgery that you expected everybody right. to recover from. This wasn't from a little gallbladder. They really yeah. were expecting most of the mice were going to die, and they and they did. So yeah, I mean, I, that that kind of I think it changed my thinking entirely uh, about about dietary restriction. And you're right. We use these in different terms. Initially, it was called dietary restriction because they just restricted the amount of diet. Yeah. But then after they decided it was calories that counted, then they started being called calorie restriction. And now, probably not exactly calories. So I don't know. Food restriction, maybe we should call what they do to the, to the mice at this point. Well, what's your take on the role of the macronutrients here? And, and I'll, I'll posit two candidates to consider. The first being a subset of amino acids, whether it be methionine, tryptophan, um, leucine would be candidates to consider. Uh, and then other things such as sugar. Um, again, the, the, the Wisconsin half of the uh, monkey experiment certainly suggested that a reduction in sucrose perhaps independent of calories could have played a role, but it's difficult because we can't disentangle it from the weight loss and other things. Um, but what do, what do we know about amino acids and their role? We certainly know that mTOR, which you brought up a moment ago, is an amino acid sensor. Uh, so how do you think that fits in? Independent of calories, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I, well, I think we need to work that out. Uh, I, you know, because there are these diets around and there are diets that say, oh, what you want to do is you want to eat as many carbs as you can and as little protein and fat as you can. And there are others that, you know, say the opposite. And I, I, don't, think that, I don't think the animal work is going to tell us a lot about that. I think we have, to, we have to try to figure out how to do the experiments in people. We have to do it in healthy people. Because I think if we want to make sick people less sick, that's great. We should be doing that. But a lot of people that are healthy want to know how to stay healthy. <clears throat> and I think that we can't do these things long term because what if you're in one that's turning out to be really bad for your health? What we need is we need some biomarkers, which you, you mentioned before. We yeah. need something so we can do an experiment of a few weeks or a few months and have the answer long term and we need to do it in people of different ages as well you know that the thing that we didn't talk about the calorie study so those was done on people who are basically in their late 30s and what's good for them is not necessarily good for what people in their 60s might want to do 
You know, one of the things I think that the intervention testing program has demonstrated that's shocking is how late in life you can start some kind of intervention and still have a dramatic improvement in health. And that to me has really major implications for people, right? Just because you're 50 years old and you've never done any exercise and you've eaten a terrible diet, doesn't mean you can't improve your health a lot.